brand new series last week simply called Prosperity by Fruitfulness. And I want to thank God that we are privileged to be on session two today. The title of today's session is Wisdom for the Humble. Somebody say with me, Wisdom for the Humble. Now, I know you have probably heard messages on humility for as long as you have been a Christian. But the truth of the matter is that this subject of humility is inexhaustible. It is one that believers must understand personally because it is very core and central in the heart of God in relating with mankind. The problem that the world has today is because the very first person to fall, who is Lucifer, fell because of pride. He suddenly wanted to exalt himself. And that's the chaos. That's the beginning of the chaos that we saw in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, when he says, and the whole world was full of darkness, and darkness covered the face of the deep. Everything became a problem when one person decided to be proud. You can read the story in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, to verse 14 thereabouts, and 15, when he started to talk about how he will exalt himself. So we need to continue to deal with the matter of pride and to continue to embrace the subject of humility as it is very much central to the heart of God. Praise the Lord. So I'd like you to bear with me today as I take you through the topic, wisdom for the humble. Our key verse today, we have been reading Psalm 19, verse 1 to 14, and as we do with our series nowadays, we read that section for throughout the series. And uh, our key verse today is still in verse 7. Now verse 7b. We started with verse 7 A, last week, and then we expounded on what that means. So if I can have Psalm 19, verse 7, I will bring on to us the things that we need to look at for today's session. Psalm 19, verse 7 says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Psalm 19, verse 7. If I can have that projected, please. Now, Last week, we looked at the fact that the law of the Lord, we said, is the word of God, is perfect. It's whole. It's complete. The Bible says it has power to convert the soul. And we expounded on how conversion of the soul talks about how your willpower, your emotions, your intellect, and your emotions need to be consistently converted in the image of Christ. And I'm explaining that because somehow we need to tie a little bit of that into what we are doing today. It says the testimony, the B part of the verse says, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Now, what I want us to know about this is that the testimony of the Lord, thank you very much for bringing that up. Let's read it together, everything in verse 7, let's go. The law of the Lord is perfect, Converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Let's read the B part again. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Now, I want to emphasize the fact that, thank you for the scripture. I want to emphasize the fact that when we say, when the Bible says the testimony of the Lord is referring to the proofs of God. Is referring to the evidence of his omnipotence, the evidence of his omniscience, the evidence of his omnipresence, the things that make him God, that make him unequal to anyone else or make others unequal to him. Those testimonies are sure. Only God can be everywhere, every time. Satan tries to make you think he can, but he's a liar. Does he not have a network that works for him all over? Sure he does. But the reality is that only God, as the individual God, can be everywhere every time. Only God knows everything every time. Only God can demonstrate his power to the max every time. Only God can speak a thing and make it come to pass. The testimonies of the Lord prove his sovereignty over the will of man. God has shown many times that his ways are truly not our ways. 
He has shown many times from scripture and even from our contemporary world today that everything he does is way beyond the doings of man. We have the Old Testament, New Testament, full of many miracles. And in our lives today, we experience his power. I am sure everyone who has been a believer for some time can testify that there are things you have gone through that only God could have intervened at that point in time and uh, that your life was either spared from death or your life was uh, supernaturally influenced in a way. You had some supernatural healing when doctors had said it was impossible or you got something that a man had said was not possible. And the Bible says, for with God, nothing shall be impossible. So in such circumstances, she proves his sovereignty, his testimonies. So I want us to be settled in the fact that God is God and his testimonies are sure, just like the Bible says. Now, we have a world that likes a lot of independence today. We are born to be Creative, we are encouraged to be innovative and independent. And this is gradually creeping into our faith, uh, or faith life. And you find many people not even wanting to believe that God exists at all. Now the truth is, whatever a person believes or they don't believe doesn't change anything about God. It changes nothing about God. You know? And I want us to understand that we do ourselves a world of good to just simply believe and accept that his testimonies are sure. If there is any part of you that is doubting anything about God today, make sure that you do not finish this service without resolving it with him. And I am very confident that everyone who truly comes to him, the Bible says everyone that comes to him must believe that he exists, that he is, and he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Many people come to God but they don't believe. And the Bible says we must believe. So the testimony of the Lord, say with me, the testimony of the Lord is sure. The Bible says it is making wise the simple. The simple here refers to one's humility expressed through, say with me, willingness, obedience, and deference. Not difference, deference, to defer, D-E-F-E-R. To defer. So the simple talks about ones who ha one who has humility that is not just lip service. It's not just lip saying. Have you ever said, have you ever heard somebody say, my humble self? And then the very next thing they do is just completely contrary to that humble self that they said they are. <laughs> so you cannot, you cannot say the two. You cannot do the two. So it is, humility is not what we say, it is what we express in our willingness, say with me, our willingness, our obedience, and our deference to God. And I'm going to explain that some more as we go on in today's session. Now, the Bible says it makes wise the simple. We're just expanding a little bit of Psalm 19, verse 7b. It says it makes wise the simple. So... The wisdom that comes for the humble is one that we need to understand. This testimony of the Lord does not give earthly wisdom. There's a difference between the earthly wisdom and godly wisdom or the wisdom from above. Everybody born of a woman on the planet operates in earthly wisdom naturally. And earthly wisdom, as we have said over and over, can deliver quite a lot. It can deliver out of creativity. It can do a lot for people. But we must all understand that only godly wisdom shows the fruit of righteousness in God. The book of James, chapter 3, verse 13 to 18, is what I want us to look at next. It clarifies the difference between this earthly wisdom and this godly wisdom. And so a believer must understand that the provisions of God for you is to walk in godly wisdom, the wisdom that comes from above. So is James chapter 3 from verse 13 to verse 18 that we will be reading. Thank you. He said, who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct. Let him demonstrate by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. 
The two things go together. Meekness and wisdom is the proof that somebody is truly wise and somebody is truly understanding. If you read verse 14, it tells you what is earthly that is usually demonstrated. Verse 14. He said, but if you have, verse 14 now, if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. I mean, verse 14. If you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. So if you are manifesting envy and self Ishness, don't say you are operating by the wisdom from above. This is the problem of today. Like I said about the falling of Lucifer, his problem was bitter envy and self-seeking. If you read Isaiah 14, it tells you very clearly. He said, I will exalt myself. He said, I will be like the most high God. Started to envy the one who created him. And then it became self-seeking. Five times he said, I will, I will, I will. It's about me, myself, and I. This exalted position he had, leading all the other angels to worship God, was no longer sufficient for him. And that became the source of demonic wisdom till today. Verse 15 says, this wisdom does not descend from above, Verse 15, thank you. But it is earthly. Somebody say it is earthly. It is sensual. It is demonic. There are three expressions of this kind of wisdom, natural wisdom. It's earthly. It's common on the earth. It is sensual because it responds only to senses and the feelings, the touch, the sight, the taste, the hearing, all those kind of things. That is what it gives. Now, it is not bad in that respect. This is how young children know when something is hot and for the first time they touch a hot iron or a hot pot or a hot kettle for the first time in their lives, they get the wisdom from the sense of feeling the burn that they should not touch it next time. And so we understand that it is not altogether bad, but it is limiting to a realm of this earth. But it can be demonic as well, whereby you can see a person inspired to do things that are completely ungodly. This is why many times we wonder how a person can think of certain kind of crimes when we hear about them. That is demonic wisdom. We have seen people get married to other people just because they want their money. They want to inherit their money. And then they plot a long series of events that can take years to implement just to get rid of that person and take over the money. There are loads of stories like that. I used to watch some crime stories, especially from America, that had stories like this. When I saw that I was getting addicted to it, I stopped watching it. <laughs> Because every story you want to just see the next story, you, you see and hear things you couldn't imagine that people can think about. This is demonic wisdom is what makes people think like that. So we all must understand that this is not what God wants for us. Verse 16 says, for where envy and self-seeking exists, confusion and everything else is there. Every evil thing is there. Believers must understand that we will, as long as we are in this flesh, we will continue to fight against the spirit of envy and selfishness. We dealt with this about two weeks ago as we ended our previous series. Selfishness. God's desire is that we live in selflessness. So the wisdom that we need to overcome envy and selfishness is the one that comes from above. Because if we live at this realm, we will continue to have problems and see confusion and every evil thing. Now let's read verse 17 together, every one of us. We're going to read verse 17 together, everybody. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure. Somebody say it is first pure. Remember last week we said the law of the Lord is perfect. And it is making it is converting the soul. 
the word, the law of the Lord is perfect. It is converting the soul. It is first pure. It is first pure. And then the Bible says it is what? Peaceable. Let's go. Then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. This is the wisdom that is from above. Anything short of what, it is, what is listed there is not the wisdom from above. It is pure. It is always wanting to make peace. Have you ever been with somebody who is just quick to always want to get you into a fit and a fist of fights? They always want to argue. They always want to. They all just want to win. They just want to dominate. Even in the simplest of things. They just always want to have their way. That is earthly wisdom. It is carnal wisdom. He said the wisdom that is from above is peaceable. It's always wanting to seek peace. And in the natural sense, it looks weak. Because when you are somebody who is always willing to defer, always willing to say, okay, if that's what you think, but this is my thought, but you know what? You can please yourself. As long as that decision is not something that is going to cost me, why not? You go ahead and do what you want to do. But if, if it's going to cost me, I'm going to tell you, well, we are differing here and we need some kind of arbitration if we have to do it together and so on. But it is done in the atmosphere of peace. And then it is gentle. It's not overbearing. It's not seeking to just, you know, to, to be heavy on the other parties. And it's always willing to yield. I talked about willingness. Again, we'll look at that a little bit more as I said. And it's full of mercy. It's always thinking of the fact that they are objects of mercy, and so they also extend mercy. And it's full of good fruits, without partiality, and it's without hypocrisy. This is the wisdom that is from above. One of the problems that make it very difficult for our generation to transfer wisdom to coming generations is because there is so much hypocrisy that the coming generations can see that is causing a problem for them to believe. And we have to fight hypocrisy. A person must have only one life, one life. What they know about you in the bedroom must be consistent with what you are demonstrating in the living room, must be consistent with what you are demonstrating in the workplace, must be consistent in what you are demonstrating in the supermarket and everywhere you go, and consistent, of course, with what you demonstrate in church. We have believers today that have five different types of lives. When you meet them at church, they're a different person. At work, they're all completely different. In fact, you won't recognize them at work. <laughs> you won't even know it's them at all. And then don't go to their house. That is another quarters that they are just completely different. Completely different. I didn't say go into anybody's bedroom, but if you can get to their bedroom, <laughs> you'll be shocked that you are seeing yet another completely different person. So such people make it very difficult for young children who are growing up around them to understand which among these five persons I'm seeing in one is the Christian. I want to believe is the one at church because that seems to be well-behaved, seems to be well-mannered, seems to be so well-cultured. But then when it goes out, it's just completely different. So we, can, we cannot be people who are living with hypocritical lives. We must be people who are completely living our lives openly and plainly for all to see. To tap into this kind of wisdom, the Bible says we must first all desire it. We must first desire it. Again, let's look at James chapter 1 from verse 5 to verse 8. We must desire this kind of wisdom. It's not a wisdom that comes naturally. James chapter 1, verse 5 to 8. It's not a wisdom that comes naturally. When a child is born, they are born with natural wisdom, and they can pick up all this kind of wisdom that we've talked about. Even demonic wisdom doesn't have to be asked for. It has to be resisted because it comes naturally. It comes naturally as part of the flesh. Let's go together, everybody. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives it to all liberally without reproach, and it will be given to him. Verse 6. 
But, verse 6 now. But let him ask in faith. Verse 6. Thank you. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Verse 7. He said, for let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Anyone who is doubting, like I said earlier on, he that comes to God must believe that he is, that he exists, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You must believe. This simple truth makes or mars your, your way of following God as a disciple and as a Christian. If you believe, like the first set of disciples he called, simply followed him when he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And they left all and followed. It's the same way everybody must just believe that he is and that he is a rewarder. When they doubted, they said, Lord, we have left all to follow you. What is in it for us? And he explained to them. He said, you have eternal life already and you will enjoy it in this life and even in the life to come. So that you are clear about that. He said, for let not that man who is doubting suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. This is a very pitiable situation to be when a person is following and they don't believe. Many believers sadly are in this realm whereby they could have been Christians for one year, five years, ten years and such a long time. But you find in their lives there's no evidence of the fruit because there is a lot of doubt. There's a lot of of natural wisdom that is still at work. Today they are good, they, they, they are full of mercy. Tomorrow they are vindictive, they are envious, they are full of pride. And that kind of person cannot receive and flow in the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God requires you to be completely free of every doubt. Doubt doesn't just mean you don't believe. Doubt also means that you are unwilling to yield to the things that is being demanded. When you know the consequence of something, you find yourself obeying. Have you ever seen a a driver zoom past you? You are on 70 on a motorway, and they just zoom past you, which means they are on 80, 90, at times even 100. And then as you are going, you see them in the front, and as you are going, as they approach the place where there is a speed camera, they slow down. Because they know the consequence of carrying on at that speed. (laughs) They probably have nine points already. So (laughs) So they'll slow down. And then you suddenly find yourself looking at them like that again. (laughs) Oh, we caught up again. (laughs) Because they know the consequence. If we know the consequence of not believing, we will not be doubting. If we know the consequence of not believing, we will not be doubting. We must be people who are completely convinced. He said, let not that man suppose he will receive from the Lord. This is why I want to lay that emphasis. He says, the testimony of the Lord is sure, but he makes wise the simple. The simple is somebody who accepts the word of God for who he is and is just willing to follow it. This is what God expects from us. Verse 8 says, for such a man is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Verse 8, such a man is unstable in all his ways. May we not be double-minded in the mighty name of Jesus. And you can ask me and say, but Brother Dave, how how can I I not, how can I be double-minded? There are so many things the Bible expects us to do, and when we don't do them, it just shows we are double-minded. It just shows we're double-minded. We don't believe. When the one we do is the one we believe. The one we don't do and we're still arguing with, it simply means that we don't believe it. And every one of us must assess ourselves consistently and see where there are traces of double-mindedness that we need to be dealing with. My responsibility is to myself. The Bible says, let every one of you examine himself. My responsibility is to myself, to check myself every time. Where am I still operating in doubt? Where is my faith not yielding completely? And your responsibility is to yourself. But we have a generation who is pointing out the faults of others consistently, not looking at themselves. And Jesus talked about that. He said such people are looking at the tiny thing in the eye of their neighbor, and then they have a log of wood (laughs) that is blocking their own eyes, and yet they don't see it. Let's not live like that. 
So to have faith is to be humble. God promised to give grace to the humble, but he opposes the proud. I want us to quickly look at some scriptures. Proverbs 3.34 and 1 Peter 5.5. 5. First, Proverbs 3.34. Humility has a way of drawing grace to you. Proverbs 3.34 says, Surely he scorns the scornful, but gives grace to the humble. He supplies grace to the humble. Surely he scorns the scornful, but gives grace to the humble. If you want grace, you want God's enablement, you want his wisdom, humility is non-negotiable. Many people have been hindered by their pride. First Peter 5.5. 5. First Peter 5.5. 5. He says, likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to, the, to your elders. Yes, all of you. All of you, all of you, be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For what? God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. God resists the proud. You see this all over scripture. James talks about it as well, James 4, 6. He said, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, we must confess and put away. Thank you. God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. We must confess and put away every pride. If we exalt ourselves, we place ourselves at odds against God. Exalting oneself and walking in pride makes us enemies of God. It makes us remind him what Lucifer did to him. We must fight against pride. The Bible says the moment you are simple, humble, God supplies you with his wisdom that is from above, that is above all. That is not sensual, that is not limited to this realm. Everyone who wants to walk with God must conscientiously put away pride. But if we humble ourselves, God gives us more grace and he exalts us. Jesus talked of a parable in Luke chapter 14. If you read it from verse 7 to verse 10, it talks about the importance of sitting at a lowly place first. But I want to read verse 10 and 11. Luke 14, 10 and 11. Luke 14, verse 10 and verse 11. Now, Jesus said in that parable, he said, when you are invited to a function, he said, don't just go and sit in the high place. I want verse 10 and 11. Thank you. Verse 10 and 11. He said, don't go and sit in a high place. He said, but you go and sit somewhere. And then if they want you at the high place, they will come and take you to the place where you ought to be. Luke 14, 10 and 11. Thank you. He said, but when you go to sit at the high place first, he said it is embarrassing when they come to you and they say, this is not the place you should be sitting. You should. I'm sure none of us want to be in that kind of place in a, in a party. It's a very horrible position to be. Very horrible. <laughs> I prefer to stay outside and they bring me inside <laughs> to where I should be sitting than I go assuming something. You can't assume anything. You can't. You can't assume anything. So when you go to a place, you stand at the door. If nobody recognizes you to tell you where to sit, just look for the last seat there that you can find and sit there quietly. It's better you finish the event and then they say, oh, we expected you at the high table. That is even more glorifying. <laughs> we were looking for you. We didn't see you on time. That's why I said, that's, that's fine. We are finished now. <laughs> now you go and sit at the high table and then you say, please, sir, one minute. <laughs> Can we have a word? <laughs> it's very horrible. So, Jesus, look, the Bible contains everything. Can you imagine Jesus talking about things like this 2,000 years ago, which we are living in today? So he said, it is better when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place so that when he who invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, go up what? Higher. He said, then you will have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. Then verse 11, verse 11, verse 11. Let's go. Everybody, let's go. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. This is a very powerful thing, and we must understand that it works in every sphere of life. And if you want, the Bible says it makes wise the simple. When you are exalted like this, it has glory and honor to it. In the year 2012, I was invited by the biggest engineering institution in Nigeria to come and deliver a talk. And uh, 
I, I, I've done that many years now. I support the different events they do from time to time when they invite me. So that day was the opening ceremony. I did not expect, because the opening ceremony, when they do opening ceremony in that kind of country, is a big form fair. You have at times the head of state or a very senior minister is present and they give speeches and, you know, they, they like drama, <laughs> they do all those things. And then, you know, then they finish it and then we who are like technocrats or people who are coming to deliver technical stuff will usually go up after that plenary, that big form fair. They will close that so those people will go and then that's when they call us up. So when I came into the hall, I went and I sat down. I sat down among the crowd. So the minister came and uh, everybody stood up and, you know, when he was coming in, then somebody came to me and said, are you not Dr. Loki? I said, yes. <laughs> he said, you're supposed to be at the high table. I said, that one is better. <laughs> that one is better. I don't want to go and sit there first. And then you tell me that I'm not supposed to be sat there. So it was nice to be escorted to the high table and it felt good to go and sit near a Nigerian minister. It felt very good. The only sad thing is that I think it was KLM or, oh yes, I'll mention it, it was KLM or Frankfurt, <laughs> what do you call them, Lufthansa. One of them bungled up my luggage, so my, the suit I wanted to wear did not arrive. <laughs> so you know me, at times I like to present in certain ways. So I wasn't too happy, but uh, that is history now. <laughs> but you know, it is better you live like that. It makes wise the simple. The more humble you are, God supplies you with his wisdom. And when you have his wisdom, you are sorted out in many areas of life. I have been in too many interview panels, not once, not twice, not five. I'm telling you where I have seen that what put a person down was their pride. Not that they didn't know it. Everybody on the panel will agree that that person knows this stuff and will be very good at this job. But then you hear phrases like he's got this thing about him. They don't want to say he's pride. He's got this air. I'm not quite sure. They ask the person who is going to line manage him or her, what do you think? You say, I don't know. <laughs> Why? Because everything oozing out of the person is pride, pride, pride. Everybody wants an innovator. Everybody wants a team player. Everybody wants a very sharp person, a creative person. But nobody wants a proud person. Nobody. They're asking you a question on the panel, and the person who asks you maybe asks from a position of ignorance. He's the one on the panel. He asks something on a position of, from a position of ignorance. Maybe they don't know certain things have changed, and then they're still talking about what used to be. And you, the interviewee, you know about it. And then the person says, what do you think about uh, Act This from 2005? And you know that it has changed to... It was changed in 2008, and they didn't know. You don't just say, ah, that is wrong. <laughs> Some people will say that that is wrong because it has changed in 2008. You first answer that this is what Acts 2005 said. But as a matter of fact, it's interesting. Then you shift it gently. It's interesting to see that when Acts 2008 came on, this is what it now said. Now, you have educated everybody. You have shown that... If you know more, there is a way you will contribute to that team, not from the position of knocking down. That man is supposed to be your line manager, and you are trying to correct him in the panel. <laughs> That's the end of your chances there. <laughs> That's the end of your chances. No way. No way. That person will say, this guy will come and take my job. And let me tell you the truth. We all encourage, I encourage young people to aspire. I want to inspire. But nobody, I don't want anybody to take my job. No. Nobody. Why, why should I want you to take my job? That's why I'm doing it. <laughs> Until I'm no more doing it. Fine. But while I'm here, no, you don't take my job. <laughs> so if you are on my panel and if you are, I'm interviewing you and you are appearing like somebody who wants to come and take my job, I will not take you. <laughs> what do you mean? I will not take you. Will take you so that tomorrow I start fighting and uh, no, 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 no. I will not take you. And nobody will take you. Because you are showing right there lack of wisdom. And I'm saying this to our younger generation especially. We need to understand something. You are blessed with so much information now and you know a lot. But like 1 Peter 5.5 5 said, respect elders. 
Respect people that have gone ahead of you. You may know more than them, but you can never have their experience. Experience is not what you gain in one day. You gain it over time. Somebody who has done something for 10 years has more experience than your knowledge that you have in the two years you are doing it, no matter who you are. He says, likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Say, yes, all of you be submissive. So it is important we all learn how to humble ourselves, to make wise, to allow the God whose testimony is sure to make wise the simple. And as we learn these things, I pray God will make open doors for us in Jesus' name. I'll give you two things very quickly that are attributes of humility that attracts God's wisdom and promotion to us. The first thing is willingness and obedience. Somebody say with me, willingness and obedience. They are, they are two in one because they go together. Jesus gave us an example, Philippians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. I'll need the projections very quickly so that we can go through them fast. The Bible says, Philippians 2, 8 and 9, it said, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. Remember what happened to him at Gethsemane? We have quoted it a lot in the last few weeks. The Bible says he came and said, Lord, if it was possible, in Luke 21, he said, if it was possible, let this cup pass over me. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. So he became willing to go, and the Bible says he humbled himself. God equated that willingness to go on with the cross as humbling himself. And then he became obedient to the point of death. Everything the Bible says was going to happen to him. He said in Isaiah 53 that he will be stricken for our iniquities. That the chastisement of our peace will be put upon him. And as they were hitting him and spitting on him. And as they were striking him, he continued to be obedient. Because it is a prophetic fulfillment. Despite the inconvenience. We know he was Famished. He said, I thirst at a point. We know he was pained. We know he was emotionally distraught. But the Bible says he continued to obey. Humility takes you through a regime of obedience that allows you to get to the point of fulfillment of God's purposes for your life. For Jesus Christ, it was death. He became obedient to the point of death even the most shameful of deaths in his time, the death on the cross. And then verse 9, the simple demonstration of willingness and obedience. Verse 9, the Bible says, let's read it together. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every other name. As you go through scripture, you will see many examples of people who simply were willing and obedient did not look at inconvenience, did not look like what it will cost them to be able to fulfill the demands of God. We're a generation now that we ask what is in it for us before we even do what is asked. It looks okay on the surface, but many times it is a wrong attitude, especially when it comes to the things of God. Jesus did not ask to be exalted. He did not sit down with his father and say, if I go and do this, what is my reward? And then the father said, you know, I will exalt you. I will give you the name above every name. And uh, at your name, every knee shall bow. No, 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 no. Jesus, God just said to him, you go, you become flesh. And you are going to die on a cross. They conversed to the very last minute. When he said, my father, my father, why have you forsaken me? Because all along, the father was watching every step of obedience to be sure that his son was doing exactly what he was sent to the earth to do. That point of death, he died and rose again is why we are here today. How many things have we robbed others of simply because we were not willing and obedient and it's simply because we are proud? Some of us are proud of our achievements in life. And for that purpose, we cannot consider ourselves doing certain things for God anymore. Some of us have degrees and qualifications that we have exalted beyond and above the things that is demanded of us. Some of us have positions and status in life 
that we think are too important to make us clean the conveniences in a church setting like this or to mop the grounds or to vacuum the place from week to week. We must be a people who are willing to be humble. I was in a meeting earlier last week with the vice chancellor of my university. Very serious meeting, very, very serious meeting where planning is going ahead for the strategy of the university. So I was invited into that uh, board to present what was going to be happening in my department and so on. And I was amazed because all the heads were brought in at different times. So I was invited at a particular time much later in the afternoon. And uh, when I got there, we were just waiting to be called in myself and uh, another colleague who was also heading another project. And so the, the room was a bit tight. It was a bit tight. But as we walked in and everybody welcomed us, I saw the vice chancellor herself stood up. And this is not the first time. I've, I've seen her do this twice stood up and started arranging the tables and the chairs so that we can have enough seats for us to sit. I've seen her carry tables in, in, at our last graduation in July, a vice chancellor of a university. In the country I come from, there will be a policeman, there will be a, there will be a personal assistant, there will be a head of department, there will be three, four people who are stood next to the vice chancellor. How can a vice chancellor carry a chair in that country? Everybody will faint. <laughs> she carried the chairs and arranged the place. And I said, this is it. This is it. This is what humility is all about. You wonder why certain things happen to certain people. The Bible says God gives grace to the humble. It doesn't care whether you are Muslim or Sikh or atheist. You just demonstrate humility in the matters that he's committed to your hand to do. He continue taking you higher. But then you see believers full of pride, full of arrogance. There is nothing in this church that I cannot do. I've done them before. Clean this place, arrange chairs, arrange tables. It's just because as the work is growing and I need to face other things that you don't see me. I used to come here. In fact, when the church started, Saturdays, I was the one only here with my wife at times that cleaned this place for the first few weeks. I'll come in and I'll vacuum and clean everywhere, get it ready. These chairs that you see have been here since 1st September, since August 2013. They've always been here like this. Everything has been set like this from day one before we saw the first member of the church. And I would do those things with joy. So as the church started to grow and people were coming, I told them, I said, guys, now we're growing. I think we should have a cleaning team. We should have people who now can take up the cleaning because it will help me free up some time on Saturday so that when I come here, I'm preaching the word and I'm teaching the word. Some of you are here by that time. Say, otherwise, I will come here instead of teaching the word, I'll be telling you, you see, if you use Dyson <laughs> or if you use Vax, because that's what I was spending my time on Saturday to do. You will clean it like this and you will go like that and the thing will be very clean. That will be your message for Sunday. They say, ah, pastor, <laughs> we don't want that kind of message. We'll get somebody in here. And that's how the Life Clean team started. Praise the Lord. But it's nothing to me. It's nothing to me. If a demand is placed on me to do anything like that, I will do it gladly for my God. Let us learn to humble ourselves. So willingness must be there. God came to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 from verse 1 to verse 3. He told him many things. But in verse 4, the Bible says, and Abraham departed, did not argue. God said to Peter, cast your net to the right side. Luke chapter 5, verse 5. The Bible says, and Peter said, we have toiled all night. We caught nothing. It doesn't look like there's anything here. But he said, nevertheless, at your word, we'll let down the net. And as soon as he did it, he caught what he had never caught before. Thank you. He said, nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. I am willing and I will be obedient. Isaiah 1.19 says, if we are willing and obedient, we shall eat the good of the land. I want you to know that if there is anything God is asking you to do, whatever that thing is, is usually tied to many things beyond it. Thank you. It's usually tied to many things that are beyond it. You may not understand the things beyond it, and what he's asking you to do may be so mundane and minute and so senseless in many cases, and may look as if it is even belittling you. But if you want to cross... You better do it. 
In John chapter 2, they lacked wine. He said, go and fill the water pots with what? With water. It looks senseless. And then to worsen it, he now said, go and draw it and give it to the chairman of the feast. Another senseless act. But as they followed one of each of those things, the Bible says, as they were willing and as they were obedient, they began to see what they were expecting. I want us all to understand this. It is very vital that willingness and obedience must continually be what we do to demonstrate humility. Be willing to love your wife. Husband, love your wives. Be willing and be obedient to do so. Wives, submit to your own husbands as unto the Lord. Be willing to do it and do it. When both are done, it is beautiful. Then you submit to one another together under God. It is a beautiful thing. Bible says that those of us who we call them masters and slaves, but it's just talking about leaders and followers. He said, let us obey our masters. Let us obey leadership. We are in a generation that does, does not like to be told what to do. Everybody just wants to do what they like, the way they like, and there is no willingness to even listen to correction. And then we wonder why life does not deliver to us in certain ways. Let us not be like that. Say with me, Lord, help me to be willing and help me to be obedient in the name of Jesus. The next very important thing is deference. I talked about it at the beginning, deference. Let's learn to have a language that defers to God every time. Not difference, but deference. We defer to God. We, we give God the glory all the time. Paul was excellent at this. Paul was a man who knew much more than every human being many human beings in his time. He was a man who was clear with the things of God. He was not among the disciples that followed Jesus physically, but he had more revelation after Jesus appeared to him on the way to Damascus. He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. What a phenomenal man. I have said to you many times that my, my heroes in Scripture, of course, Jesus Christ remains our number one hero, my name, number two hero is King David, phenomenal man. Not because I was named after him, but I'm very grateful. I'm very grateful for that name. One of the things I keep thanking God for my parents is that they called me David. Because it's such a wonderful thing to think that I'm named after that, that man. When I see a David that is behaving like a non-entity, <laughs> I say, you, you don't get it, man. You don't get it. <laughs> you don't know who you are named after. The most powerful king ever. This one man that, you know, you just can't decipher. Nobody till today can explain the source of David's wealth. Nobody. People say he fought wars, he got spoils of war. The kind of money that they said he used to build, to put down to build the temple, you don't get it from spoil of war. So when we get to heaven, now we say, why didn't you tell us? Why didn't you tell us? Even those of us who were named after you. <laughs> but the truth is this. After King David, I don't think there's any other character in the Bible I would respect like Apostle Paul. Controversial figure in many ways, of course. But this guy was so passionate about God, they stoned him two times. They thought he was dead. He himself thought he was dead. When he opened one eye, and he opened the other eye, and he found that he was still alive, he got up again and continued to the next city to preach. Paul said, what you see me demonstrate is humility. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 9 and verse 10. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 9 and verse 10. He said, for I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God. Thank you, verse 10 now. Let's read verse 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am and his grace towards me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Talking about the previous disciples who were apostles before him. He said, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. A man so endowed, referring so much to the grace, the grace, the grace. This is how God wants us to be differing. God wants us to differ to him. 
When Joseph, in Genesis chapter 41, verse 15 to verse 16, when Joseph was called in to, to be asked, after Pharaoh said that there is nobody in the kingdom that can tell me my dreams. In Genesis chapter 41, verse 15 and verse 16, the Bible says, Joseph said, it is not in me. It is not in me to give you the revelation of your dream, but there is a God up in heaven. There is a God up in heaven. Hallelujah. Let's read it together. Thank you. He said, so Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Verse 17. Verse 17. Verse 17 now. Oh, I gave you 15 and 16. Go back then. Go back. Sorry. Go back to verse 15. Thank you. Go back to verse 15. See what Pharaoh said to him. Okay, let's go. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream and there is no one who can interpret it. But I have heard it said of you that you can understand a dream and to interpret it. At this point in time, he has interpreted dream at least openly, apart from his own. He has interpreted dream openly twice in the prison that everybody saw that it came to pass, without a doubt. As a matter of fact, he said one will be killed, that was killed. The one that was restored is the one who remind, remembered and told Pharaoh about Joseph, that there is a guy that can interpret dreams. So, go back to verse 15. Go back to verse 15. Thank you. He said, but I have heard it said of you that you can understand a dream and to interpret it. Everybody, let's shout again, verse 16, what uh, Joseph said. This is the spirit of difference that works in humility. Verse 16, verse 16. Everybody, let's go. So Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Don't take what you should not take upon yourself. When somebody comes to you and says, because you gave them money, maybe you gave them 500 pounds or something tangible, 1,000, 2,000, something very tangible in their very, very desperate time of need. And they come to you and say, brother, sister, you are the most important thing that has ever happened to me in life. Don't take it to yourself. Don't say, I don't want to die before my time. <laughs> say, I love you very much, but God is the most important thing that has ever happened to you. Let's praise God. Don't stay there and say, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's what we like to do. <laughs> it's just what I do. Don't mention, don't mention, but mention it again tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Terrible, terrible, terrible. He says, it's not in me. It's not in me. When anybody gives you accolades, remember the grace of God that is at work in you. Whatever you are able to do today is because God gave you grace to do it. Do you know that not everybody can do what you do? No, not everybody can do what you do. I used to tell my wife, she can go into a kitchen now, this time, and by 12, a, a dinner is ready. I can't. I, she is so gifted. A, a dinner is ready in 20 minutes. Pulls this, pulls that, uses this. And she's so quick. And it will still be very tasty. Give me two hours. I still cannot make, your, make it work together. <laughs> so I said to her, I said, do you know not everybody can do things like this? It's a natural gift, quite okay. But maybe you can teach people. So I told her, open a YouTube channel. And I will be your manager of the channel. <laughs> Because I'm sure you'll get a big following for this. I will make some money from it. Me, I think business a lot. I think business a lot. <laughs> but the reality is that not everybody can do what you do. Don't take it for granted. And when people praise you for it, remember like Joseph, say, it is not in me. It is God who has engraced me. And may God continue to help you in Jesus' name. There are many examples of people like this. David said before Saul in terms of Goliath, he said, God, who gave me the bear, the lion, he will deliver me. First Samuel 17. Nehemiah in Nehemiah 2, when Sambalat and Tobiah said he cannot do it, they can't rebuild the wall, he said, the God of heaven, he will prosper us. In Nehemiah 2.20. I want to conclude this by saying what Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 to verse 9. Somebody say, is pastor really rounding up? Say, Pastor, <laughs> say, thank God for Pastor. I look at the time, it's 20 minutes to 12, and I'm rounding up. God is helping me. I'm born again now. <laughs> I'm born again now. Definitely, if it's 20 minutes to 12, and I'm rounding up now, something is happening. Praise God. Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 to verse 9. 
Paul said, this is what we should all be saying, like Paul. But what things were gained to me, I have counted loss for Christ. Philippians chapter 3, verse 7. I'm on verse 8 now. He said, yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Hallelujah. He said, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. If you read from verse 1 to verse 6, he was talking about his accolades, how he was converted and how he has so much knowledge of the law and those things. He said, but yet all these things I count loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Verse 9 says, and being found in him, not having my own righteousness. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. The Bible says in Philippians 3.10, our righteousness is as filthy rags. He said, so I'm not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but which is through, that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which is of God by faith. Everyone who wants the wisdom of God to be at work in them must learn how to be humble, must learn how to be simple. The testimony put back for me, Psalm 19 verse 7, the testimony of the Lord is sure. The testimony of the Lord is sure. It is making wise the simple. You want more wisdom your way for the things you do? Be humble, be simple, be gentle. I have told you this many times. The higher you go in life, the more God helps you to attain higher things, have more status, more money, more position, more this, more that. The more your big battle against pride will have to be. You change your machine gun from, from a pistol to a machine gun, and from a machine gun, you keep improving your ammunition to a war tank. The higher you are going, the more humble you become. You have to become. You have to fight it. One of the things I like about British politics is that it puts everybody as first among equals every time. That is why they can change prime minister when they like. <laughs> when you misbehave, they get rid of you and put the next equal. All those guys in the front bench are regarded as equals. They are all right honorables. So if one messes up or is not getting the thing correctly, they say, man, shift. You shift, you next equal, come, come and be prime minister. And as soon as they put the person, you see the respect. They defer to that person. Have you noticed that? If the world is too proud. They need to come and learn from this country. Even Americans, they need to come and learn from this. <laughs> it's not perfect, but it is one of the most solid, most reasonable, and decent ways of making leadership work among people. Not one president that will be, let's, let's, let's stop there. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's rise to our feet. Let's rise to our feet.